Good morning. As we make our way to our respective seats, we'd like to welcome each of you here this morning. And for those of you that are worshiping at home as well, we welcome you to our service. We come today as a body of believers in Jesus Christ. We come as individuals. But our desire is that we worship our Lord and Savior. And as we come this day, we pray that you would set aside those things that might encumber you from giving your all this morning as we prepare ourselves for worship in God's place. Let us now come. Thank you, Sue, for that beautiful reminder that our world is created by our God for us to enjoy. Thank you so much for that beautiful prelude. Will you please join me now in the call to worship found in your worship guide from Psalm 71. God is our rock and our fortress, our refuge and strength. Praise the Lord. Let us worship together as we continue in prayer. God of all glory and of all grace, as you receive our praise, hear our prayer. Let our adoration be not merely lip service, but go heart deep. May our prayers be not shopping list of wants, but conversations grounded in commitment. And may our faith be not confined 
to this time and this place of worship, but be woven into the very fabric of our lives. By faith, may we hear your voice, and by grace, may we answer your call. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you now to stand as we sing hymn number nine. Holy God, we praise your name. Please stand. Good morning. Yeah, sorry. Okay, this morning's reading is taken from the book of Luke, chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. And God's word so reads, And he was teaching in one of the synagogues of the Sabbath. And there was a woman who for 18 years had had a sickness caused by a spirit, and she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, are you freed? You are freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. But the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, 
there are six days in which work should be done. So come during them and get healed, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath unite his ox and his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said this, all his opponents were being humiliated, and the entire crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things being done by him. Parables of mustard seed and leaven. May God have blessings through the reading of his holy word, for this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite our children to come down for our children's time. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? How's school going? Good. Are you learning anything yet? Yes and no. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad we're getting our money's worth. Yeah, this is great. Well, did y'all just hear the story that Mr. Michael read? That is about a woman who was bent over for 18 years. Okay, so let me show you. All right, so she was like bent over like this. She couldn't stand up. Can you imagine? Y'all stand up for a minute. Let's try it. So imagine, okay, bend over like this. Imagine having to walk around and not being able to look up. Wouldn't that be horrible for 18 years? Can you imagine? That's terrible, isn't it? Yeah. Well, Jesus saw her, and he felt sorry for her. Wouldn't you feel sorry for her, too, if you saw someone like that? Well, he felt sorry for her, and he loved her and decided to heal her. So he did. He healed her, and she was able to stand up and look around. But there was a big problem. Do you know what the problem was? What? Okay, I'll tell you what the problem was. It was on, Jesus healed her on the Sabbath. Do you know what the Sabbath is? Do you know what that word means? No. So it's a word that folks used and still use to describe the holy day. It's sort of like, our, you know, Sunday is our holy day. Well, the Sabbath is the holy day for folks who are Jewish. And it starts at sundown on Friday night, goes all the way to Saturday at sundown. That's their holy day. So Jesus healed on that day. And back in Jesus' day, you could not do any work on the Sabbath. You couldn't do anything. So the religious leaders got really mad at Jesus because he was working, working, you know, working to heal this woman. And Jesus was healing her because he loved her. And so he told that he told them, he said, isn't it better that I heal someone on this day, even though it's the holy day, than to follow this law? But it made the the religious leaders very mad at Jesus because he broke their rules. Well, let me ask you a question. Let's think about the woman. How do you think she felt before she was healed, when she was bent over like that? What do you think she felt? How would, how would you sad? sad? Tired. Tired? Yeah. Can you think anything else, Christian? You think that's right? You think she was sad and tired? Yeah, if you were bent over, you'd have to sit like that, too. That's right. That's right. So she was healed. Well, what do you think she, what do you, let's imagine, what happened after she was healed? How do you think she felt? Happy. Happy? Woohoo! Yeah, that's right. She celebrated. And do you, what do you think she, do you think she, what did she say to Jesus, do you think? Thank you. Thank you. That's right. That's right. I am sure that she was grateful. And that she told Jesus she was thankful. Well, I have a little sheet for you to do. It's in my box here. It's a little prayer. Here, can I have that? Yes. Okay, so let me help you. Let me read you what it says. It says, the woman Jesus healed might have prayed for making me stand straight again, God. I thank you. So I want you to think about your summer, you know, because your summer's kind of over with. And I want you to write a thank you prayer to God for your summer. So like right here, you would put things that you're thankful for. 
So think about your summer. What were some things you're thankful for that you did this summer? What? Nothing. Nothing? Okay. Well, think about it. You can think about it. I know y'all had some trips you went on. You probably went swimming. Think about all the fun things you did. And you can draw them or write them. And if you need a pencil, I have lots of colored pencils in my box here you can take. But before you go back to your seat and take one of these, will you please pray with me? Okay? Pray with me. Dear God, dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for healing the bent over woman. And thank you for the gift of our summer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Okay, watch out. You can get some colored pencils and you can go back to your seat. Go back to your seat, okay? Let us continue as we lift up our voices in praise, singing hymn 306. Come, Christians, join to sing. Please stand. Will you please join me in a time of prayer? Holy God, as you healed the bent over woman, we know that you can heal those within our sphere of love. So we ask now for healing for those that we lift aloud in name. Lord, hear our prayers. 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 We sing of you, our holy God, who is immortal and invisible, and our God who is light, inaccessible, hid from our eyes. You are unresting, unhasting, and silent as light. In you, eternal God, we encounter mysteries we cannot comprehend, 
and the majesty of your ways far surpasses our richest imagining. We long for a thousand tongues to sing the praise of you who calms our fears. Your name sings its own music in our ears. In you, gentle shepherd, we see God on earth. We know the tenderness of your embrace and the compassion of your care. In you, great redeemer, we see the blight, the blind receive sight, and the bent over stand tall. And we see the lame jump for joy and the brokenhearted rejoice. We sing of you, O God, who leads us beside still waters to restore our souls and quiet our restless hearts. But sometimes, O God, our best worship of you is silence. So now still our bodies and still our voices and still our souls, that we may enter your presence in holy silence. So now we take these few moments of silence to enter into your holiness. May this be our true worship. In the name of the Creator and the Redeemer and the Sustainer, we pray. Amen. like to welcome these folks who are worshiping with us from home this day. Uh, Joyce Marlowe, uh, Mike and Diane Goodwin from Florida, Mike and Sandy Finnerfrock who are in Maine today, and then Carl Ponstingle. We're so glad that you all joined us this day.
So today we continue in our series from the book of Hebrews. I'm going to be reading Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 to 29. You have not come to something that can be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that not another word be spoken to them, for they could not endure the order that was given. If any animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned to death. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels and festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse the one who is speaking, For if they did not escape when they refused the one who warned them on earth, how much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of what is shaken, that is created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks, by which we offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For indeed, our God is a consuming fire. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So the name of our sermon this day is, Which God Do You Worship? Well, the passage that Michael read a few moments ago is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. I love that story because Jesus rejects the laws of his day to care for someone. Someone who was literally bent over for 18 years. Imagine that. Imagine not being able to see the bright blue sky. Imagine not being able to see a shooting star in the night sky. Imagine not being able to see the tops of the trees filled with singing birds swaying with the wind. Imagine not being able to see the majestic blue mountains that surround our beautiful body, our beautiful valley. And for me, not being able to see into my honey's eyes, because he's way up there, and not being able to see his graying hair would be very disappointing. It would be very disappointing. This woman, she was bent over, and all she could see was the ground. Imagine. We talk about being burdened with things that weigh us down, and this woman was weighed down by her body's inability to straighten up. She was weighed down by a society that deemed following their laws of honoring the Sabbath was more important than her own life. She was weighed down by those who cared not one bit that she had been suffering for 18 years. And then Jesus comes along. He sees her pain. He sees her burden. He sees the cruelty of legalism and laws that were meant to provide rest. And he heals her. He releases her from her burden and all that weighed her down. And she is able to look straight into Jesus' eyes 
And she begins to praise God. I love this story because this, this is the God I want to worship. One who cares for each and every person so much that Jesus was willing to break the law to heal this bent over woman. I want to worship a God who loves beyond laws and rules and legalism. And I want to worship a God who loves relentlessly. This is the God I want to worship. But our passage in Hebrews that I just read portrays a different kind of God. So Lainey Peters tells this story. At her church, she was beginning a program called Watershed, which was a discipleship class for youth who wanted to be baptized. The initial meeting was an opportunity for the participants in this go-around, three seventh-grade girls and a ninth-grade boy. It was an opportunity for them to meet their pastor and then their mentors, which were carefully chosen adults who would accompany each of these young people on their faith journey. They met in a pizza restaurant and enjoyed a relaxing meal together, and then they heard what was going on in each other's lives. And each young person was asked to share why they were interested in being baptized. Now, the church was a church similar to ours in the Baptist tradition that accepted believers by immersion, although they, like us, would accept people from other traditions if the person discerned that his or her baptism experience was equivalent. And in that case, then, they would offer basically a confirmation class. So each of the girls, those seventh grade girls, shared in her own way her desire to get to know God better, to be, disciple, to be a disciple of Christ, and to join their church. It seemed that they were at a point in their faith development where a mentor would be extremely helpful to them, someone that could walk along beside them and share their faith in appropriate ways and help these young women um, as they made this intentional decision to be a Christian. Now, Tim, on the other hand, the ninth grade boy, he listened intently as the girls spoke. And then they said, well, Tim, why don't you share with us what you're thinking? So with a thoughtful look on his face, he said, well, I am looking forward to this experience because, you see, I have a lot of questions. The first one is, why does God in the Bible act as if God has a split personality? Sometimes God is really kind and loving and forgiving, but then God gets all angry and wants to punish the people and sometimes even hurt people. So after a pause, you can imagine all the adults around the table had to wait just a moment and think about what he said. And finally, his mentor, bless his heart, said, What a fascinating observation, Tim. You and I are going to have a great time in this process. Well, I think our ninth grade friend, Tim, could well have been thinking about the God, or gods, that is portrayed in our passage of Scripture today. First, the author reminds the people of the God that Moses and the people of Israel encountered at Mount Sinai. You remember the story? The mountain is shaking and trembling, and the people are afraid. These folks' encounter was with God's voice on a mountain shredded in dark clouds. And from the mountain comes fire and clouds and darkness. And then from all of that, God spoke. It must have been a terrifying encounter with God. Can you imagine? I imagine they were all shaking in their boots. But then the author of Hebrews turns away from this fearsome God who met Moses and the people on Mount Sinai to the presence of God on Mount Zion, 
which is a festal gathering. It's a festive time, a party. Mount Zion is the name for Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is the place where God lives and is surrounded by those who have had a relationship with God. You see, Jerusalem is God's party place. It's God's favorite place. And then, just when we're getting ready and excited about partying with God in Jerusalem, the tone changes again in verse 25. And suddenly, we are warned that if we are not careful, this time, God will not only shake the earth, but the heaven as well. Then all of this is summed up by the writer inviting us or admonishing us to offer God our acceptable worship with reverence and awe, with a further warning that God is a consuming fire. This sure doesn't sound like a festive way to worship, does it? Andy Dillard once wrote, does anyone have the foggiest idea of the power we so blithely invoke? It is madness to wear ladies' straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. And then they should lash us all to our pews. And even more than this, the creator God is the God of the supernova and the neutron stars. While our son Reed was home a few weeks ago, he talked at great length about the James Webb Telescope. And I know I mentioned this several weeks ago in worship, but it is so fascinating. So I wanted to show you a few images today. So this is the James Webb Telescope. It's a true marvel in its Invention. It took the engineers 20 years to create this telescope. Lots of budget overruns, which did not make Congress happy, as you can imagine. But this is an image of the telescope. I'm not going to go into the science behind it because it's complicated. But you can read about it. So that's the first image. So now the second image that we're going to see. Okay, so this is a dying star giving off gas and dust. Now, you see all those points of light in the background of that dying star? Those are not just stars. Those are galaxies. It's amazing. So now image three. Oh, look at this. This is amazing. Okay, so this is from the telescope, and this image is a patch of sky approximately the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length by someone on the ground. So think about that. Think about how big our sky is. Think about holding a grain of sand. That's what's in that grain of sand. And in this picture, there is a star. That's okay, Brian. There's a star that's over 13 billion years old that they think. And they, so it took 13 billion years for that light to get here. Isn't that amazing? And then this one, okay, that, so there, yeah, that was it. Anyway, so now on this one, image four, we see the Carina Nebula, and the, this is where stars, this is a star nursery. This is a baby star nursery where new stars are being formed. Isn't that amazing that we can see that with this telescope? The God who created this vast universe was the God who spoke from that dark cloud that covered Mount Sinai. This is the God of righteousness, holiness, and judgment. But then Hebrews gives us another image of God, and that's the party in God who loves Jerusalem and loves Jerusalem's people. But this God, the party in God from Jerusalem, also inspires awe and wonder. And we are now wowed by this graciousness and hospitality of God's majesty. 
You see, God is now present in Mount Zion, and the city of the living God is now envisioned. This is now the age of the new covenant made possible through the gift of Jesus and gathered with Jesus in this new Zion are uncounted angels who are singing in festival harmony with Jesus. Present in glory are all the righteous who have lived in hope of a heavenly Jerusalem. But God, we learn throughout the Bible, is also a fierce God of judgment and holiness. God, who is beyond our comprehension, is also a God of incredible mercy and sacrificial love. God, who created the universe that we see through the James Webb telescope, is the same God who took time to heal the bent over woman. In Hebrews, the coming of the glorious new covenant through Jesus is contrasted with the old covenant. All of the following images of God I'm getting ready to speak are ones found in the book of Hebrews. You have a high and holy lifted up God who is not able to understand our human weakness. That is the same God who graciously and wondrously made known the merciful and faithful high priest, Jesus Christ. Jesus, who, when he made purification for sins, sat down with God of power and glory and judgment, of thundering and lightning and earthquake and galaxies and stars and baby star nurseries, is also the God revealed in the thrones of grace that we may all now approach with boldness and receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. You see, the God of the all-powerful, the creator of the universe, is concerned about the powerless. God of all creation, the one who created the vast universe, is concerned with each creature in the creation. But then the author of Hebrews makes a third turn. And now we must examine the God of mercy, who is also the God of judgment. Now, personally, I don't really like to talk about that kind of God because I prefer to focus on mercy. But that would not be the God of Scripture because God is also a God of judgment. And when we think about it, Would we really be pleased in the end if we discovered that God did not really care about injustice or cruelty or evil? That God did not care whether we tried to build at least some aspects of the kingdom here on earth, earth as it is in heaven? Ultimately, God's justice and judgment must be included in God's love. Therefore, wrongs are still to be judged by the God of love and mercy. So, my friends, which God do you worship? Hebrews makes it clear that the God of Mount Sinai is the same God of Mount Zion. The God who shook Mount Sinai and who created all that is, is the same God who envisioned the party on Mount Zion, and is the same God who calls us into account. So Tim, that young person who was contemplating being a Christian, that little Tim who asked about whether God had a split personality, I think the answer is probably yes. God is all of that and much, much more. So much more than we can think or we can imagine. What a joy and privilege we have to be able to worship such a God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now, as we enter enter into a time of reflection... I invite you to speak to God in silence, and I'll give you a few prompts along the way. 
First, as you think about the God who created the universe, what do you need to say to God? Secondly, when we think of God who came in the form of Jesus, who healed the bent over woman, what do you need to say? And thirdly, when you contemplate the God who calls us to account for our actions, our mistakes, and our sins, what do you need to say to God? God, we thank you for the privilege and the honor of worshiping you this day. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to stand and sing together a hymn of response. It's hymn number 500, Just As I Am, one of our favorites. And I'll be down front to welcome anyone who would like to learn more about following Jesus or to become a member of our church. So let's stand and sing together hymn number 500. Please be seated for just a moment. Here's an oldie but a goodie, uh, but a goodie. Uh, pastor friend of mine wrote for his group, the Magruders, some years ago. I'm not super lucky, I'm in this by design, salvation for my soul was God's idea, not mine, so a lamb was slain, blood was shed, the Lord took all the blame, to purchase my salvation, to pay sin's curse and shame, I've been blood bought, and I've been mercy sought, when I stumble of love I've been taught I've been hell taught but I've been truth taught but I know that I can make it cause I'm blood bought three, three men on the crosses on my Calvary one red condemnation one begged clemency 
But on the middle cross with the crown of thorns hung our hope for liberty. And when he cried, it is finished, since death was paid for me. I've been blood bought, and I've been mercy sought. And when I stumbled in the arms of love, I've been caught. I've been hell fought, but I've been truth taught. And I know that I can make it cause I'm blood bought. Yes, I've been blood bought. I've been mercy sought. When I stumbled in the arms of love, I've been caught. I've been hell fought, but I've been truth taught. And I know that I can make it cause I'm blood bought. Yes, I know that I can make it cause I'm blood bought. My, 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 I know that I can make it cause I'm blood bought. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, as we just take a few moments in conclusion of this service, as we give thanks to you for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us throughout the week and throughout the years of our lives. It is at this time we have an opportunity to give back to you, to this church. Through these tithes and offerings, Lord, we just pray that your message would be extended throughout this community and the world. Please accept these, our gifts, as we present them to you this day. For it's in the name of Christ we do pray. Amen. For just a moment, is that Kathy, you and Philip, come stand yep. up here with me. <laughs> Want to introduce to you two folks who have been visiting with us for quite some time. This is Philip and Kathy Saka Lucas. Did I do all right? Yes. yes. Okay, all right, wonderful. Well, they would like to join with our congregation. Um, they are moving their membership from the church in Manassas. Um, they recently moved out here to live with a daughter. Um, Kathy is a retired um, dental office guru, and Philip is now working at Walmart. So we are thrilled to have them um, in our community and look forward to the ways that we can all love and serve God together. So thank you so much for coming this day. So, folks, let's welcome them into our congregation by saying amen. Amen. So, if you two don't mind standing here at the end of the service, then y'all come down and welcome them into our church. Shake their hand, give them a hug, and let them know how glad that you are that they're here. So, so thank you so much. Y'all want to have a seat for just a moment? And I'm going to go back up here for the common concerns. Make sure to take note of the announcements that are in your worship guide, including our school, um, uh, what do you call those things? <laughs> Backpack program, yes. Oh my goodness, backpack program, we're starting up again. Um, this is our first week. We're going to be providing food for 30 backpacks for E. Wilson Morrison, so there's information in there about that. Also, we have a movie night planned on September the 16th. I'm a back-to-school movie night for our children from E. Wilson Elementary School, um, and also our kids here in the Fellowship Hall. We're going to watch Peter Rabbit. So if you want to come and help, we would love to have you. We're going to have pizza and just have a wonderful time together. So I encourage you to, to come on that night, and we'll watch a movie together starting at 530. I wanted to read a letter to you all. Give me just a moment. Pull it up. So, you know, I, I think this is a yay First Baptist letter. So this is why I wanted to read this to us today. So this is dated August the 13th. 
Dear Reverend McMillan Goodwin and First Baptist members, thank you so much for effectively ministering to our granddaughter, Lindsay Culpepper, this summer. Lindsay sat right back there. Um, she was here every Sunday um, this summer, and now she's gone back to Mississippi State. As you know, she was a long way from home in an unfamiliar area where she knew no one. Obviously, we were concerned about how her summer would go. As it turned out, she had a wonderful experience in Front Royal. Her work, her supervisor, and her work associates up at the um, conservatory, the um, Smithsonian Conservatory, helped make the internship an enjoyable learning experience. In addition, finding your church and worshiping you was a major highlight of her summer. She talked about how you welcomed her and made her feel comfortable. She was also very impressed with the various ministries that you're involved in. She said to us, that is what a church ought to be. Thus, your exposure to your church was also a very valuable learning experience for her. She voiced the fact that she really hated to leave your church as she returned to Birmingham. Your actions toward her certainly demonstrated the love, compassion, and kindness of Christ, and we are very thankful that she found you. We will be in prayer for you, for your ministry, as time goes on. And this was written by Marie and Tony Hendricks. They are Lindsay's grandparents. So, so thank you, First Baptist, and thank you for the ways that you welcomed Lindsay this summer. Let's keep up the good work as we welcome those. Also want to make note of the flowers that are on our communion table today. They are given by Jason Hill's family. It's been seven years on the 24th since his death. And as I was talking to Rachel before the service, the death of a child is something no parent should go through. So we, we continue to remember and celebrate Jason's life with you and also surround you with our prayers and our love as you continue to grieve his loss. Will you please stand now for the benediction? My friends, today marks the gift of a brand new week. This gift gives each of us the opportunity to love and to serve, to forgive and to reconcile and to show love, grace, and mercy. The gift of this brand new week is a gift from the God that we worship and serve. So go now, my friends, with this gift grateful for it, and energized to live this week to the fullest. Go now in peace. Amen.